and I was in the fifth floor of the Sofitel Hotel here in Redwood City, um, nearing midnight, around the clock depositions, producing documents, etc., happening for a series of days. And when I closed my laptop, the entire left side of my body froze up. And I thought I was having um, my moment, you know, in my early to mid 30s. And I thought I was having a, a stroke or a heart attack. I didn't know it was the left side of the body. Mm. Didn't know what it was, just everything went numb. I, I thought this was it, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's very scary. I was very scared. I ultimately went to the hospital, got checked out the ER, everything was fine. But I realized that this was, this was stress talking and this was my body talking. And it was at that moment that I decided that I needed to leave the practice. Good afternoon, Rudier. Hey, Charles. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. Um, my name is Rudier Christel. I am a executive coach for lawyers. I work with lawyers on a range of issues, uh, including teaching mindfulness, um, working on their leadership. And then I work with law firms and legal departments, just hosting conversations on some of the more challenging topics or issues that we face in the practice. And Rudir, would you mind describing how it is that you came into that work? It's it's an interesting interesting path. I was uh, at, I was a partner at Fish and Richardson. That's where I started my practice. Um, I was there for ten years in the DC office, and then I transitioned over to Apple in house. So I moved out to the Bay Area. Apple was a client, and. Um, that transition then happened about seven years ago. And after about um, five years at the practice, five years at Apple, I started to identify certain challenges in the practice. And that's what started piquing my interest towards this path. Uh, so before that, seven years ago, you were still a partner at Fish and Richardson in Washington, D.C. Uh, what motivated the change uh, to a different coast and then also to a different setting uh, in-house? Yeah, I was at the, um, in the middle of a very intense uh, legal practice uh, in addition to doing pro bono work and um, volunteering with the Bar Association, uh, supporting the PABA. And it was actually... Um, at the close of discovery on a pretty big case, I was on, you know, this was a, an international case or international clients involved, um, a lot of traveling, and we were honing in on the closing, close of discovery in ITC, and so it's an intense patent litigation case. And I was in the fifth floor of the Sofitel Hotel here in Redwood City, um, nearing midnight around the clock depositions, producing documents, et cetera, happening for a series of days. And when I closed my laptop, the entire left side of my body froze up. And I thought I was having um, my moment, you know, in my early to mid thirties. And I thought I was having a, a stroke or a heart attack. I didn't know it was the left side of the body. Mm. Didn't know what it was, just everything went numb. Um, I ultimately went to the hospital, got checked out the ER, everything was fine, but I realized that this was, this was stress talking and this was my body talking and it was at that moment that I decided that I needed to leave the practice. Um, so I started putting out feelers on making a move in house and luckily Apple was a client at the time mm -hmm. and they were happy to have me in that transition. Interestingly enough, I didn't share this story with anyone at the firm. I didn't feel comfortable. I felt like it would make me look weak uh, as a litigator that I had some sort of a, a health issue. And so rather than trying to work something out at the firm, I thought the best thing to do was to <laughs> leave the coast <laughs> and go to the other, other side of the country, yeah. uh, which is quite, quite fascinating in retrospect. Uh, in that moment when you were in uh, that hotel in Redwood City closing your laptop and the left side of your body uh, goes numb, what, what was going through your mind at the time? I, I thought this was it, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's very scary. I was very scared. Um, I ended up FaceTiming with a cousin of mine who's a cardiologist. And she said, you know, I need, I need you to get to the ER right away. Mm. And so I, I called the front desk, made it out to the hospital, but I was alone. Mm. You know, I'm here, not at home. It's uh, midnight here, so 3 a.m. out there. And so really no connection sitting in a hospital with no family around. Um, it was a really scary moment for me and not something that I felt like repeating. Mm. You know, you have this health moment. Uh, approximately six years ago in Redwood City, uh, where you feel the fear right? because the left side of your body is uh, gone numb after working days and nights on a case in front of the ITC. Uh, the doctor says you're okay. You choose to go in-house um, and you stick with that for a number of years. Uh, but what was it uh, in that experience? What were you going through that um, led you to the decision to take a sabbatical? Yeah, I think a few things were happening, um, and it was at around four years into working at Apple, I started to notice a few things. First, that other people were experiencing um, real challenges of, of, of stress and health in the practice. I had at that point maybe 10 or 15 friends that were in their either early 40s or even younger than that, that had, had either a heart attack the onset of diabetes, uh, a mini stroke. Mm -hmm. I'd actually known two litigators that passed away mm -hmm. at a pretty young age. And so it was, it was on my mind. Um, it's not something I could dedicate all my time to. I had my, had my full-time job. But it is something that I've always done in the margins is, is care for the team, is think about um, what everybody needs. It's definitely something that I had always sort of uh, kept as part of my practice. Um, and the other thing that, I ha that happened is I stopped getting an interest in the carrot that was being offered at work, which is you do good work, you get more, more work, or you do a big deal and you get a bigger deal, or the carrot is a higher salary or another title. And, and that seemed less and less inviting to me at this stage. And so there was a calling to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, I had been complaining. I was talking to my wife and saying, I, I wish I was a high school guidance counselor. Like, I wish I could just go back and do the thing I dreamed about as a kid. Or, um, you know, there's something different out there. I, I kept telling her, I need a month or two off. Mm -hmm. I need a month or two off just to think. And mm -hmm. my wife looked at me and said, a month or two off isn't going to do anything. You need a year. And I just thought, a year? I mean, I don't, that wasn't even something that had come to my mind is taking a year off. And I told her, I said, you know, I don't think the company gives a year. And she said, well, then you're just going to have to take it. And it was that conversation that really shifted everything for me. Um, I had always been a, a, seen myself as a breadwinner or wanting to be the one that supports. And my wife said, here's what we're going to do. She said, I'm going to be the breadwinner now. You don't have to do a thing um, for a year. You don't have to earn a thing. Mm. And I'm sure that whatever it is that you'll do will be great. And I think what I needed was that permission mm -hmm. and just that acceptance from somebody that no matter what you do, I'm with you. I have faith in you and I support you. Um, it was really powerful. Uh, as soon as she said that and then we budgeted for it and made sure that we would be okay uh, for a year, all signs were pointing towards me taking that break. Mm. Well, that shows a lot of trust and love. It's one of the most loving things I think I've ever received or one of the kindest things that anyone's ever done for me is just mm -hmm. give me that faith and comfort that it's really saying, whoever you are, I'm with you. Whatever it is that you do, I support you. Uh, I don't think a lot of us are lucky enough to receive that. I think that was one of the first times I'd ever heard anything like that. And uh, I took my chance. <laughs> as soon as he offered it, I was, I was ready to go. So... Um, and uh, how did you decide what to do during that year? Because, uh, you know, uh, I imagine, I, I recall post-bar trip, first time I'd ever had a long vacation, and I, I knew what to do for the first week, which is eat and play basketball and swim. And, and then week two and three, I kind of 
well, I, I had an entirely different pace of what I expected of myself. It's scary as a lawyer, let me tell you, because I had never taken a real vacation, I don't think. Um, you know, even when you're on vacation as a lawyer, you're still working. And so to have real time off with really no end to it in, in particular, um, it's a scary proposition. And that first week was really telling. Uh, first, I had a panic three days in. I made the wrong call. This was crazy. I should call them back. <laughs> you know, what will happen? And my wife, my wife calmed me down from that. You know, everything will be all right. And then um, a week in, I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to put together a weekly report because, you know, my friends want to know what's happening. What, what's this guy doing on his time off? And she that looked at me. That is such a lawyer thing. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me and she said, look, you don't have to bill any time. You don't have to turn in a quarterly or weekly report nobody cares and your worth is not measured by a monthly billing report so it's time for you to get out of that mindset and i was in shock i just didn't think there was any value to me outside of what i reported i'd been doing it for so long there was such a deep practice that unless i told someone and put down the hours or let someone know what i was doing and what the next steps were it was meaningless and so that left me sort of stranded i didn't know what to do <laughs> And how did you uh, come to adjust and find what to do during that year? Um, it took two months to really adjust and settle down and start to enjoy. I left on May 1st, or May 1st was my last day, and it was July 1st that I woke up and I said, I'm going to enjoy this. For two months, I didn't stream a show, um, I didn't take a huge break, I just I didn't know what to do. And finally, after a couple of months, I just decided, oh my gosh, I have a year. Let me start making the most of it. And that's when I started to plan and actually just start to enjoy. And it was an amazing time after that. And uh, so uh, May 1 is when you uh, took that leap. Uh, I think you said it was July 1 when you allowed yourself permission to enjoy it. Uh, what was that journey like for the rest of the time you took off? It was, it was amazing. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that any lawyer, uh, really anybody early in their career, save up so that something like this is possible. It's just an incredible experience. Uh, the first thing I did, you know, as lawyers, we're always gathering information from others. We're deposing others. We're discovering things about other people. And I think as we flex that muscle, we may not flex that for ourselves. And so I actually... I deposed myself. I just started writing and I started writing and writing every day. I, I, I committed to 2,000 words a day and I just sat at my desk and as much as I could write, I would, I would put down and I ended up with a Word document with 80,000 words. Wow. Just going and going and it was fascinating what came out. The things that I had learned from the practice, the things that I had seen, the issues that I had had. Uh, it's an incredible learning experience about myself and about the practice itself. And I think that began the unfolding on the direction that I wanted to go. It really started to concretize what it is that I cared about, what are the things that challenged me, and then the things that I really wanted to work on. At what point in your sabbatical did you decide, you know what, um, appreciate the path I've been on, appreciate Apple, but I'm not going back to that. Yeah, if there was ever any moment, uh, there were a lot of scary moments on the break because here was a transition point mm -hmm. and it's in moments of transition that fear comes up, mm -hmm. that we get scared. And so the natural tendency when we get scared is to go back to where we came from. That's the easy and safe <laughs> step is I'm at the edge of the diving board. Let me take four steps back to the safe place. Regress. Yeah, yeah. And so the challenge to me was that I put on myself is just unless I'm at the edge of the diving board, I'm not really living this moment. I'm not about to, to jump and do something exciting, so let me stay there. And so I, there were many moments when I wanted to go back, but it was just a constant reminder to really stay the path, stay the course, something, you know, there, there's a transition happening here. Hmm. And uh, how did you realize that you needed to be at the edge of that diving board in order to be living, living your moment? I think when you experience that edge, 
there's an exciting feeling there and you know what it is in your life when you're at that edge, you know those moments. Um, and then you start knowing the difference between that feeling and when you step back. Mm. It's a safe place stepping back and I think we can get very comfortable there, but it's not anything like the feeling of being at the edge. And so as long as you sort of sit with that moment long enough to remember that feeling, then that becomes what, what you go for. And so even today I tell myself, well, as soon as things get easy and comfortable, I got to go back to the edge. Um, but it was a nice reminder on how to experience forward momentum is just be at that place. Oftentimes we think that place of excitement, we confuse it with fear and the need to protect. And I think when we start telling ourselves that's actually what living is, that's the real experience that becomes what we, what we move towards. And so that's what, what I'm, what I was going for. That's what I keep going for now. And it reminds me as practicing lawyers that were taught uh, through practice and discipline to sublimate uh, that, that feeling, right? The need for that feeling of, uh, of life and challenge and really living, you know, living one's life. Uh, and to defer, uh, you know, defer things that might otherwise you know, feel right to to a human being. It's a, you know, in some respects, it's a it, it's kind of a dehumanizing dehumanizing experience. Uh, but some point during your uh, year long sabbatical, you set on a uh, a concrete path to make the choice to live the life that you're living right now, doing the things that you're doing. Uh, how did you come to that decision? Well, I think part of it has to do a lot with what you just said is I do think in the legal practice, there is this suppression of feelings. I think that we are so outwardly focused on what's happening for others um, that we may stop paying attention to what's happening for us inside. And so, and, and it's a very critical thinking practice. It's a really, um, it's a high intensity practice, a lot of overwhelm. And so we value a lot of lawyers for being, for being smart. It's a very head heavy practice, but I think what we might lose sight of over in that over flexing of that muscle is, is what's happening in our heart. What's happening in our gut. What's your intuition telling you? What is it that you really want? And I think when I spent that time flexing those muscles, the plan started to unfold, which is, well, what if I was just doing the thing that I enjoyed and I was naturally good at all the time rather than trying to sneak it in on the margins at work, um, rather than being the person that's talking about a team building activity. What if I was the one that was actually just hosting it for many companies rather than being the, the soundboard for an individual at work? What if I was that all the time and I was doing the thing that I really enjoyed about work, which was making people happier in the workplace, uh, creating a lot of synergy amongst teams and then trying to bring the intensity down. And so, it was sort of the, my, you know, what I was good at, what I saw a need for, and what I thought people were valuing was turning into the job description as I was exploring um, this break, this time off. Um, and in uh, doing your executive coaching and your leadership training practice, what have you observed in the profession um, that uh, you identified as a, you know, specifically as a need. Yeah, I think the greater need that I've seen is that as we get more senior in the practice, there are certain skills that we learn early, critical thinking, um, issue spotting, uh, meeting those tight deadlines. And, and that's what makes us a good lawyer. And so we need to be able to do that is identify what's wrong with this contract or see a case and just identify um, you know, what the real issues are and, and what is the best way of presenting this. But I think that experiencing or practicing that mindset over many years um, starts to work against us as lawyers. And I think that's what I'm seeing is that in mid to later stages in people's careers, that muscle on critical thinking, that muscle on skepticism, the, the muscle on comparing gets over flexed. And lawyers don't only see the work uh, with that lens, they start to look at other people with that lens. They start to look at themselves with that lens. 
And so now they see a lot of wrong and a lot of challenge in, in, in whatever it is that they're doing. There's a lot of judging that can happen. Unwinding that or trying to keep a little bit of a distance between the work and how you are to yourself, how you are personally, how you are with others can go a long way. And so that's what I've seen a lot of is really sort of pushing back on and almost unearthing and unwinding some of the things that we learn early that make us just really good at what we do. And if uh, lawyers become successful as they're wa- rising through practice, practicing that, uh, that critical judgment muscle, uh, what muscles are, have you observed are, uh, are underutilized and what are those, uh, what do we see in the consequences for the lawyers' lives at that point? Well, I, it's interesting, although we do so much work for others, we're constantly in service. I think one of the muscles that needs more flexing is, you know, what do I need? What do I need to care for myself? Mm-hmm. And I think oftentimes lawyers don't ask that if, if there's a challenging problem for someone else, they're the first to solve it. But if there's something complex or challenging going on for themselves, are they paying it that same attention? So it's something interesting to, to think about. Um, the other thing that I've seen, but there's studies on this, it's not just what I've seen with my clients, but there's studies on this, but I have clients that will literally say to me, you know, I used to be empathetic or have a lot of compassion in college and, and even going into law school, but I feel like I've lost it. Mm. Like someone tells me something and I'm just looking for the facts and trying to solve it. Like the feeling is gone. And that's just not an individual uh, narrative from a particular, you know, from a few clients. That's actually... There's research and study that shows over time that lawyers tend to, to lose some of these traits and qualities. Um, you and I talk a lot about leadership, but those are actually critical qualities for leadership. And it's something that may actually get worked out of us in our profession over time. Uh, and it's something to pay attention to. And for a practicing lawyer uh, in that circumstance, who's been practicing and uh, developing the critical uh, judgment um, muscle. Uh, how does uh, how does one in that position develop and recover one's uh, empathy muscle? Um, this is where the the mindfulness work comes in. I think it's a huge, huge um, antidote and and practice that I, I invite people to invest in. Um, you know, I'm not asking lawyers to stop being critical thinkers or to be um, to be good at what they do what we're the invitation is is that that thinking not take over everything and so a mindfulness practice can invite people to have an awareness of their thoughts an awareness of of what's happening and, and the feelings that are taking place and when you're paying attention to that uh, without judgment without saying that anything is wrong you can choose to believe a certain thought or not. If you're being judgmental about something or someone, you can actually be curious and say, oh, what's that coming from? Why am I, why am I thinking that? Uh, what's a different way to think about that person? Uh, mindfulness and meditation can really help slow down some of that really active narrative that's going on in our head and slow things down. We're actually starting to be a bit more discerning and discriminatory about the thoughts that we're having internally. And I think when you can start to invite that type of discernment internally about your own thoughts, uh, it can really help protect you from really sort of believing that you have to act a certain way all the time. Hmm. Wonder if there's any sign uh, that a lawyer can identify uh, that should alert them that they either need a change or that they should seek some assistance. Yeah, you know, what comes up for me is when I had that incident um, with my health, it was actually paying attention to it. You know, oftentimes when something happens to us, we, we tend to ignore it and we just move on to the next thing or we, or we fight through. And I think it's actually just stopping and paying attention and if, you're, if your body's talking or something's happening internally where you feel a challenge, it's actually going in and listening to that for a little bit and paying attention to what's happening for you. Even in my transition um, out of the in-house role, 
there was an urge to do something different. And if I don't pay attention to that, then I could just, it's the same thing again and again. So, you know, the invitation is if, if there is a challenge, if something's difficult or there's something that you want to change, it's, it's worth paying attention to and listening. Hmm. Uh, and uh, just imagining what it's like to have the experience of counseling, counseling law lawyers about what they're going through and their careers. I, I uh, you know, I can't imagine there are too many counselors who would relish that experience just because of, uh, you know, how critical lawyers can be. Uh, what does it take uh, to kind of peel away those layers where lawyers are more receptive to counseling? Um, it's really interesting to watch and, and see an experience. I have found that, you know, the issues that I work with are very challenging. People are facing uh, a lot of pressure to uh, bring in business. Uh, in the house folks have a lot of political challenges. They're locked into a certain corporate structure and there are a lot of difficulties that people could experience. Folks that may want to transition their career um, and even the experiences that we might have uh, based on intersectionality, whether we are attorneys of color or women in a the practice, there are a lot of challenges that people experience. And what's interesting for me is that I learned that supporting people with some of the most difficult aspects of their lives actually gives me energy. Mm. It's something that I did not feel when I was in uh, the work in the practice is at the end of a call, I probably feel a little bit more tired than when I started. But in this current role, as I'm supporting people, I'm getting more energy as I'm going along because I'm helping uh, identify and unearth challenges and helping move people towards something that is, uh, is more fulfilling for them. And so it's been a very, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting and energizing experience for me. And on their end, I think it's very refreshing for people to have a conversation where they're not being judged, where they're actually just being heard for their challenges. Oftentimes when you are a lawyer and you're in a room full of lawyers, if you do something that feels a little bit out of the ordinary, you're constantly thinking, what are these people going to think about me? So to be in a space and have an opportunity to just say what's on your mind, knowing no one's going to judge it to share what's going on for you, knowing that no one's going to criticize it or tell you what to do. Uh, that space alone, I think, goes a, lot of, goes a long way for, for my clients and um, I think for lawyers generally. And it's not something that it, it's, it's helpful that they work with me, but I think it says something about how we can be with each other as lawyers is, again, do we always have to be critical and judge with our colleagues and our friends when we're not doing the work? Is there a different way that we can listen um, that is actually just giving real attention to people? Or is there a place that we can create as a practitioner where we can go that we feel safe and comfortable just being open about whatever's going on for us? And so I think there's, there's a nice invitation for that in the practice. Rudir, is there any advice that you could offer soon-to-be lawyers who are about to embark on their career? Yeah, I think it's, uh, that's an exciting time, and it's really just to stay in touch with that excitement. Uh, keep thinking about what brought me to law school, what's the work I wanted to do coming out. Um, oftentimes people lose that sense of fulfillment or excitement over time, and it's just really remembering you know, every year or every few years, am I doing something that's fulfilling for me? Am I, am I moving towards the thing that I really wanted? Um, or has what I wanted changed. And so just constantly paying attention. Oftentimes what happens in the practice is that we start paying attention to the other messages that are going on outside, what a law firm might value, what a company might value, what some of our peers and colleagues might value. But I think what's most important is what all of us value as an individual. And so really making sure that people are tapping into that because that, that has something, there's information there. And I think over time, um, we may lose sight of that. And so really just tapping back into uh, what's the change that you wanted to make? What's the difference you wanted to make when you became a lawyer? Uh, what are the parts of the practice that you value the most? And really making sure that you're, you're moving towards that. 
I wonder if you can comment on some of the common challenges that you've experienced with your clients. Some of the more um, typical things that people work with me on are the challenges of, uh, of business development and retaining clients. I think that's a significant challenge that, that, lawyers, that lawyers experience. Um, dealing with the, the, the politics and the nature of people at work, <clears throat> particularly in-house, when you're in some of these, um, if you're in a challenging work environment, there's no room to move. Uh, the law firm environment is a bit more of a free market. In-house, you're in sort of a monarchy. You're, you're stuck in a corporate structure. And so oftentimes, if you're with someone that is challenging or a team that might be challenging, um, there's a lot of value to uh, trying to work through some of those difficulties that you might experience. Um, and then if you're not fulfilled, how do I move towards that? If this isn't what you want to do, really making that transition to that career path, that is something um, that's more exciting, whether it's a different company or a different place of work or maybe a different practice area or maybe just an entirely different vocation all in and of itself. That, that can be a lot of, uh, create a lot of challenge for people. But I think the most interesting thing that I see is as good as lawyers are at advocacy and arguing on behalf of another client is how challenging it can be for lawyers to have difficult conversations with the people around them. Mm. You'll often see lawyers, I often hear from my clients, you know, when they're trying to move forward on something, ask for something, trying to move their organization in a certain direction, having that difficult conversation with someone, if someone slights them or says something, or is holding them back from going for what they want to go for, or even that difficult conversation that people can have when retaining clients. Some of these difficult conversations that people have are, are really challenging for people. And it's interesting, although lawyers are great, again, at doing that on behalf of someone else, ask them to negotiate a favorable contact or contract or make an argument in court, uh, they're very comfortable doing it on behalf of someone else. But when they're doing it on behalf of themselves, it can feel really challenging. Hmm. You've identified uh, three circumstances uh, that you com commonly encounter with your clients, uh, including uh, law firm clients and you know, kind of attracting and retaining uh, business, uh, in-house clients being uh, stuck in a uh, corporate structure. Maybe there's someone difficult uh, in that role, and then the generalized situation where people uh, don't feel fulfilled. Um, and then made the observation that, uh, that oftentimes lawyers aren't comfortable having difficult conversations, particularly as it relates to advocating for oneself or, um, uh, you know, versus a client. Uh, those are pretty fundamental and difficult things. Uh, I, I wonder how, you know, one begins to approach challenges like that. You know, for me, the experience has been that people are dedicating the time and energy towards it. Oftentimes, this is a thing that we skip over. Once something's difficult, we want to move on or we want to avoid it. And so it's actually getting more comfortable with what's difficult. That is, uh, it's a great practice and it's something that I feel like uh, I work with my clients on and it has a lot of value. I think once people start becoming a bit more comfortable with some of the challenges that they face and actually getting a bit more intimate with them, we, we start moving away from these things. And as they move towards them, um, they see a lot of growth and progress in these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I got to know each other through an affinity bar organization first called NAPAPA and then ABBA. Um, I wonder if you've observed or noticed uh, common challenges that, uh, that people of color in particular encounter in the profession. Yeah, the, 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 the challenges that I talk about are, I think, very unique then um, when you uh, place intersectionality on top of it, when you are talking about women or people of color or um, LGBTQ attorneys, there are, the challenges become even that much more unique. And well, the practice is already difficult. The deadlines are already challenging. The demand is already high. And then when you place a, an issue that's based on, on race or gender on top of that, 
it can really have an impact on on an individual. And so I think there's this intersection between well-being, and we talk a lot about lawyer well-being now, but there's this interesting intersection between lawyer well-being and, and diversity-related issues. And one of the things that I see a lot of are <clears throat> when attorneys are treated like they are they are different. And it happens now in in subtle ways. It doesn't happen necessarily in overt ways, but it happens in subtle ways. Um, you know, I've seen it in my work experience, and I know you know many clients that have this challenge. I had a client who was the only uh, woman now on the executive level or a board. Not, I'm not revealing anything about a client here because that's a pretty common thing. If there's a, a woman that makes it onto a senior executive level, she might be finding herself as one of the only people there. Um, it's a challenge when that person is then asked to take on the, the secretarial duties. You know, they, they join an executive level and they're now being invited in to do uh, tasks that don't reflect their seniority. But again, it's a reminder that people might be treating you a certain way because of, of your gender or your race. And when that happens, when we experience that bias, it can be extremely challenging on our own well-being. And so I've seen this a lot in, with clients. It happens in subtle ways. Um, it happens in overt ways but it can create a real challenge uh, in the practice. And so I, I, I talk often about the tools and the ways that we can, uh, the things that we can do to help manage some of these challenging experiences because they don't go away. Um, they tend to compound over our career. And so something happens to you five years ago and then three years ago, and then even this morning at the water cooler, someone might say something and, and for us, there's a spillover effect. It might not even be what happened today that's really challenging. It's just that over years, you keep hearing and seeing things. Um, and so how we weather that and how we manage those challenges is something that um, it's an interesting space to work in, and it's something that I really value in supporting my clients on. Uh, what makes for a meaningful life? That's a great question. Um, there's this, uh, this image or this uh, uh, notion that it's like that ikigai, Japanese ikigai. And I've never read anything about it. I don't know what the root of that notion or sentiment is, but I've seen an image and it basically says that uh, you find your purpose when you are at the center of doing something that you love that people need or that the world needs um, that you're good at and that's sustaining or that you can get maybe some, some money for or sustenance out of. And when I started my career, you know, my father passed away when I was in law school. And so losing the, the, the patriarch and the breadwinner, for me it was I need to go make money and I need to go support the family. And so I went down this path of becoming a lawyer in the private sector. Um, that was the invitation for that. And so I started my career on what do I, you know, what makes money? And then can I learn the skills where, where people clearly need this? Can I learn the skills to be good at it? But I never got around, you know, after 15 years, I never got around to this deep feeling of do I really love what I do? I love the people at the firm that I worked at. I love the people at Apple. I enjoy the experience, but I can't say that I deeply love the work. And so when I took my time off, I went out the other way. I started asking myself, just what do I love? What do I enjoy the most? And then what do people need? And then I got skilled at that. And so the final piece is, can I sustain myself doing that? And I didn't ask myself that first. I actually asked myself the first three questions over and over and over again. And I think now that I'm in a sustained practice, yes, that came true, but that's not what I was going for first this time around. And it's created for me a lot of meaning. Uh, I wake up every day and I look at my schedule and it's busy, but it's busy with things that I just love doing. You know, I have calls with clients, I'm meeting with law firms to talk about some great work that we can do. I'm talking with folks about leadership programming and training. and so. Every day when I look at my calendar, I feel that meaning and that purpose, and I'm glad that I went around it this way in the cycle um, this time around.
Well, thank you for doing meaningful and good work. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Charles, for having me. I really appreciate it.